We at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace are delighted to be welcoming you back here, Jeff. Uh, so welcome. Thank you much. It's good to be back. Jeff, this year, 2022, is the 25th anniversary of the Israel Committee Against House Demolitions. Say a word about how ICAD began and tell us about what ICAD's continuing work is today. Well, ICAD, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, began in 1997. Um, so for people in the know, that's a significant date. 1990, at the end of 1995, in the middle of the Oslo peace process, in which Israel is negotiating with the Palestinians over the future, whether it's two states or, or whatever, Rabin is assassinated. And uh, very quickly after that, um, Israel holds an election. And in the election, Netanyahu is elected. Benjamin, on, on an explicitly anti-peace process uh, ticket. So the Israeli government, the new Israeli government, repudiates the Oslo peace process. Now, the left had, in Israel, the peace camp, had really given a lot of, uh, of hope uh, that maybe this process would lead somewhere. The, the sides are meeting, they're negotiating, but it became clear that the occupation was not going to end. On the contrary, it's going to get stronger. And so uh, a number of groups on the left got together, Israeli groups. And we decided we had to re-engage in uh, resisting the occupation. Uh, and we asked our Palestinian colleagues, comrades, what issue did they think we should focus on that would be really a priority issue for them? And the issue of house demolitions came up all the time. It affected almost every Palestinian family. Um, that Israel has a policy of demolishing Palestinian homes, not only in the occupied territories, but inside Israel as well. Uh, so that uh, we, took, we took that on, but we were an activist group. Uh, and so over time, we began to work with families. We began to understand the house demolition issue, who issues the orders, why are they issued, what are Israel's intents, what happens to the Palestinians, you know, the whole human dimension. And we did that as activists. Um, until finally, at some point, we began to get a little bit of money. People were willing to contribute. So we were able to raise enough money to actually rebuild homes that had been demolished as political acts of resistance. Not humanitarian, certainly, and the Palestinians would never agree to that, but as joint acts of resistance. So we built almost 200 houses over the last 25 years, since 1997. And if you think of them as 200 joint acts of resistance to occupation through the rebuilding of homes, that's really significant. Uh, and then, you know, from there, we, we really began to understand how the occupation works and where Israel is going with it and so on. And so we began, you know, we've always been a political organization, not simply an activist or a protest group. And so we've taken what we know um, we have photographs, we have films, we have PowerPoint presentations, we've written books, we've written articles, we have a lot of advocacy materials, and we've tried to put it together and go reach out and begin to uh, advocate for a political resolution of this uh, conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as it's called, uh, so that I think ICANN has become, over the last 25 years, one of the leading political voices. Most organizations are either activists, you know, they go out and they protest, but without a political agenda, or they're NGOs that deal with a particular issue, I mean, important issues, the wall or, uh, you know, children or women's education, things, but they're not political in that sense. ICAD puts together Israelis working with Palestinians, um, and the whole idea of what would be a, a just political resolution, um, and that's, I think, what's made us, the, what's made us not only unique, um, but we really have a lot of credibility with Palestinians, which is not easy for an Israeli organization. Uh, so in that, from that point of view, I think we're, if I can say so modestly, I think we're one, a significant, one of the most significant political organizations on the ground, and then, of course, because it's so important to mobilize the international civil society in support of the Palestinian struggle, uh, working with ICAD USA and all kinds of other groups abroad, 
um, we've been really instrumental in, in being a bridge between Palestinians and critical Israelis on the one side and supporters of the political struggle uh, you know, on the other side. So it's both advocacy, but it's also mobilization. Uh, and, uh, and now, just in the last uh, couple of years, with our Palestinian partners, we've been engaged in, in the One Democratic State campaign, which actually is now a beginning of a formulation of a political resolution uh, based upon the idea of creating one democratic state. So ICANN has, evo has evolved over the years from an activist group to an advocacy group, and now a political group that is really beginning to uh, promote uh, a political solution to this uh, terrible situation. I'm glad you brought up the one democratic state because I want to follow up on that. <clears throat> you uh, are one of the... You're one of the Israeli Jewish co-leaders of a Palestinian-led mm -hmm. One Democratic State campaign. And you emphasize always that it's Palestinian-led. So I want, I want you to tell us more about Palestinian leadership, but even more importantly, than why Palestinian-led is so important. Why, why do you continue to emphasize that? Well, in many ways, this is a Palestinian struggle. You know, in, in our analysis, in our, in our opinion, um, Zionism was a settler colonial movement. There was an invasion of Palestine by a foreign group, the Zionist movement of Jews, uh, you know, the late 19th century into Palestine with the intent of taking it over. So that's, so even though Israelis, uh, certainly Israeli Jews in the one state idea remain in the country. I mean, nobody's going to throw them out or whatever. They're not a legitimate side. In other words, there is no idea. That's why we don't like the idea of conflict. There's no symmetry between uh, colonists coming in and, and taking over a country and displacing the local population with the intent of replacing them on the one side and the resistance of the indigenous people to being displaced and dispossessed. You can't compare them. So that, so that in our view, the Israeli side or the Israeli isn't a side. There is no legitimacy to it, which means that this is a Palestinian struggle. The Palestinians have to be the ones that decide two things. First of all, what is liberation for them? How can they, after a hundred and some years in which they've been displaced, and, de and deculturalized and lost their lands and lost everything, uh, basically, you know, and, and half the Palestinians live as refugees abroad. Um, what do they need to bring their people together again, to have some sovereignty, some control of their lives, to reclaim their culture, to reclaim their lands, to reclaim a national life? What do they need? And that's a, a Palestinian decision. And secondly, then, then the question becomes, all right, how do we reconcile our needs as Palestinian, as a Palestinian people, to, to restore ourselves with the fact that we have to live in a common country where half the population are Israeli Jews. So it's, it's a double sort of, but those decisions have to be made by the Palestinians because they're the indigenous people. They're the one whose country this is, in a sense. And it can't be the colonists that determine again and, and continue forever to determine how how everybody's going to live in the country. And from that point of view, it's a Palestinian struggle, and, uh, and we respect that. You know, certainly we as, uh, as critical Israelis, anti-colonial Israelis, respect that. And so you know, we obviously um, um, share our ideas. With, we're partners with Palestinians. Uh, we share our ideas, and, and, and obviously there has to be Israeli input, because in the end, Israelis are a part of of the solution and, and, and so on. But if there's a partnership, it's, it's, it's that the Palestinians are the senior partners and we're the junior partners. And that's why we put so much emphasis on, um, on a Palestinian-led movement. That, that gives, that's what gives it its legitimacy. You, uh, you mentioned briefly in your answer to this question <clears throat> the settler colonial framework. Mm -hmm. And one of the... There's, there's a shift that's taken place 
right, uh, with a number of people. You've Sorry. been one of the f folks who's been talking about this for a while now. Uh, the need to shift the way we think uh, about what's happening in Israel-Palestine from a conflict framework right. to one of settler colonialism. Descri describe in more detail right. that shift and why that's so important. It's not simply a semantic shift. Uh, terms are important. You know, when you go to a hospital, um, a doctor has to, has to diagnose what's wrong with you. So they look at symptoms and so on, and they come to a diagnosis, and, and that diagnosis then determines the treatment. So you don't just jump to grabbing whatever medicines you have off the shelf. The treatment has to flow from how you, how you analyze what the, what the medical problem is. And it's the same here. If you see this as a conflict, it's going to lead, its logic is going to lead you to a particular kind of solution. Whereas if you see it as a settler colonial uh, situation, you go somewhere else. So, th you know, th there's a tie between what is the type of problem you're trying to solve and how do you resolve it. A conflict uh, is between two or more sides. You know, now, the minute you say sides, again, what I was saying before, you're already legitimizing the Israeli side. In other words, you're legitimizing the colonists. So that already is unacceptable. The idea of a conflict is that the sides somehow get into a fight with each other. There's some dispute that they're, that they're fighting about. That's the conflict. Well, here there's no dispute. I mean, the Palestinians never had a fight with, the, with Jews. They never had an issue with the Jews living in Poland or, or whatever. There's no, they were invaded by a foreign force intent on displacing them and, and, and taking over their country. So, so, there's, so, there's a, so there's no dispute. <laughs> there's invasion and, and, and defense and resistance. But there's nothing, there's nothing the Palestinians are, are fighting about except, except you know, they, they want to uh, uh, get rid of this settler colonial uh, enterprise. And how do you resolve a dispute in, in a conflict resolution sense? You get the sides together and they negotiate and they compromise. What are the Palestinians supposed to compromise on? I mean, the Palestinians have been invaded. What they're supposed to say, okay, you can take half our country or three quarters of our, I mean, what are they supposed to negotiate? Are they supposed to negotiate the lands they lost? Half the Palestinian population has been thrown out of the country. They're refugees. What are they going to negotiate? That half the refugees come back or, I mean, there are, there are, th are they going to negotiate their identity? their culture, their, their right to, uh, to uh, a land. Uh, I mean, there are such fundamental issues here that are their national rights and their cultural rights to live as a people in their own country securely, that there's nothing to compromise. So conflict is, 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 is the wrong framework. Um, and then conflict then would, lead, if it's compromised, well, that's what leads you to the two-state solution, which is, the United States government, all the governments, everybody, Israel, you know, that's what they all want. Why do they want that? Because the two-state solution perpetuates the colonial situation. The colonists, in fact, the Israelis have taken over the whole country. So they'll create, a, 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 you know, a Palestinian Bantustan in the South African sense, where this, the Palestinian population is confined to maybe islands on 15% of the country. They'll call those islands a state. They'll have a president, like Abu Mazen is the president today of the Palestinian Authority, and that's your two-state solution. So you've, you've kept the whole colonial enterprise uh, intact, and all the structures of control and domination are intact. And so what are the Palestinians? You see, it's, it's a colonial solution to a, uh, to a colonial defined, to, to the idea of a conflict, but if it's a conflict, it legitimizes the colonial enterprise. And that's completely unacceptable. So to completely clear that out of the way and prepare the ground for a genuine, just resolution, you have to see this as a settler colonial uh, situation in which there's our, uh, you know, the, uh, the Zionists came into Palestine with the intent, again, of taking it over as settlers. In other words, their idea was we will replace the Palestinians we will transform an Arab country into a Jewish country. 
Palestine will become Israel. Um, so there's no sides here. You know, that's what they're imposing on the Palestinians. This the Palestinians what? cannot accept that. They have to resist. And therefore, and therefore, um, um, you know, but, but then the resistance is delegitimized as terrorism. This is why you emphasize that while it's very important to delegitimize Israel, that's the, that's the, sec, that's the penultimate step. That's then right. you have to politically decolonize. That's right. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not so much to de delegitimize Israel. You have to delegitimize. Uh, I mean, state. it was never, it was never, the, the settler colonial project was never legitimized. You can't legitimize yeah. colonialism in any sense. So, so, since it has no right to exist as a colonial entity, um, but it has the military strength and the political strength, given the support of the United States and other countries, um, you have to fight it. But in the end, how do you end settler colonialism? Through decolonization, yeah. not through compromise. You see, that's where the, that's where the solution flows from the, how you define the, the thing. If it's a conflict, you compromise and get to a two-state idea. If it's a settler colonial enterprise, you dismantle decolonize, dismantle the colonial structures of control and domination, and then you get to a place where it's actually the indigenous people that have most of the say in terms of how they see the society structured, in which, yes, uh, uh, Israel ceases to exist as a Jewish state, because that's a colonial en enterprise, but Israelis continue to exist in the country, they have a right to be in the country, they'll be equal citizens, but it'll be decolonized. So uh, these are, are two, these are like apples and oranges, you see. And unless you're clear about, about what, what, what the fight is about and, and, and how it can be resolved, you end up being in a muddle. <coughs> and I think that's where we are today. I think the politicians that are trying to negotiate this either don't understand the nature of the conflict. And that's how you've had now from the Rogers plan, we've had 70, you know, we have 50 years of feudal negotiations, or, or they do know, and they're simply using this conflict resolution model in order to justify and legitimize and perpetuate a colonial enterprise. You know, uh, using the medical model is really important. Diagnosis, prognosis, you know, right. diagnosis, symptoms, right. prescription, I mean, that, that's, that's an important uh, framework. You know, one of the first terms I learned from you back, I mean, we've known each other now almost 18 years. One of the first uh, uh, terms that you created to describe Israel's domination of Palestinians, and I hear it, people using it over and over again, is matrix of control. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tony Blair used it once. Ah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> give us a few examples two or three examples, right. maybe most, the most egregious ones, of Israel's matrix of control right. over Palestinians. Well, the matrix of control was, was trying to make the point. You see, uh, you know, everybody, again, is within the two-state paradigm. Well, then the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza that were conquered in 1967 um, are, are, are occupied territory. Well, occupied territory um, in international law means a temporary military situation. You're not allowed, according to the Fourth Geneva Convention, for example, if you're an occupying power like Israel is, you're not allowed to settle an occupied territory. You're not allowed to, um, to uh, um, build highways or to build the wall that Israel built. You're not allowed to change the status quo of the occupied territory, because the idea is that, that that territory will be disposed of through negotiations. And if the occupying power changes the status so that they're in permanent control, that, prejudice, that forecloses any, any negotiations. Which is, and, so, and so what I'm trying to, uh, to do in this major control idea is to show, in fact, how Israel is trying to make permanent its control over the occupied territories, even though, and this is, again, the game of this two-state solution conflict resolution, even though they talk about negotiations, 
de facto, they're making the occupation permanent. So it's a matrix of control. And a matrix means it has different layers to it. You know, there's physical layers. You have checkpoints. There are something like 650 checkpoints throughout the, uh, the West Bank. And what's significant is um, only about 17 or 18 of them or so are on the border, on the green line between Israel and the West Bank. In other words, you think, all right, if checkpoints are for security, then they would be securing Israelis from Palestinians. No, but that's not, almost all the checkpoints are inside, deep Bank. inside, that control Palestinian movement. You see, so that, you know, physical in the sense of settlements. I mean, there are now uh, uh, about 800,000 Israelis living illegally, according to international law, in, uh, in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. The annexation of East Jerusalem is illegal. The fact that East Jerusalem is now considered uh, uh, Israel and, and, and part of the capital of Israel. You know, so you have those physical things, and then you have a legal a legal layer so that the Palestinians are enmeshed in a whole matrix, a web of all kinds of regulations and laws and military orders mm -hmm. that paralyze them. So, uh, so you know, uh, if they want to build a home, they have to get into an expensive and protracted and complex planning process that in fact leads them to no home. In 98% of the cases, Palestinians, are their home demolition applications for building homes on their own land are denied. You see, so it's a, it's a, um, a pretend kind of a process so that Israel can say, look, you know, we're uh, democratic and we're, you know, we're not, you know, we have mechanisms of planning, which is good. But in fact, it's really a mechanism of control that prevents Palestinians from having homes and from building on their lands. And there's other layers. There's, there's, the, uh, there's a political layer. There's an infrastructural layer, you know, where Israel has laid out a matrix, a huge matrix of 28 major highways that then incorporate the West Bank irreversibly into Israel. Um, and then there's the issue of policy. I mean, there's a, the, the matrix control is very complex. But the point of it is that it creates structures that, that, uh, that make Israel's rule and control over the occupied territories permanent. And, and, from that, and that alone then disqualifies the two-state solution. It's not going to be. You know, I remember <clears throat> two decades ago, Jeff, you talking about Israel as, quote, an apartheid regime. Mm. Now, of course, lately, uh, Yeshdin, B'Tselem, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, various church denominations and others have adopted apartheid language right. to describe Israel's oppression of Palestinians. Why is the use of that language, apartheid, that particular word, uh, why, why is that so, so important? I mean, it, it recalls mm -hmm. South Africa. It's right. got... It's got uh, 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 legal ramifications. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about why calling Israel's oppression apartheid mm -hmm. is so important. Well, it flows from the settler colonial idea. I mean, it, it, it's the, the uh, necessary uh, result of settler colonialism. In other words, um, the United States is a settler colonial regime. Yeah. But what the United States succeeded in doing is so totally marginalizing the indigenous population, the Native American population, um, that they're not really a factor anymore. You know, they're, they're small, scattered groups. They're powerless. They're marginalized. So the United States doesn't need an apartheid regime. It can give them full citizenship because they're not a demographic threat or a political threat to the United States. But in countries like South Africa and Israel, where the indigenous population is large. I mean, the Palestinians today are the majority between the river and the sea. Um, and they're not, a, you know, the Native Americans have given up the idea of, uh, I mean, they, they there's no idea of overthrowing the settler American government. I mean, that's ridiculous. So they're, they're focused on creating, on carving out cultural spaces, economic spaces for themselves in their own areas. But the Palestinians 
uh, have not given up their national aspirations. That yes, they do want to overthrow the Israeli colonial regime and establish either a Palestinian regime. They're, they're still thinking of liberation in a in a in a political sense. So, uh, so then that puts the the settler colonists in a certain situation. If they claim the entire country, as Israel does, this is the land of Israel, right? And they want all the land, because that's the, the, the heart of settler colonialism is, is the land. Without the land, you're, you know, you're, it's just a, a, a claim to a country. The land is the country. Um, uh, so, so, um, so if you claim the country and you take all the land, and it's all yours exclusively, but now you're left with more than half the population that's not your people. You know, it's not Jewish, it's Palestinian. What do you do with them? You can't drive them out of the country. They're too, they're too numerous, they're too entrenched, and the international community would not allow you, even, uh, even Biden wouldn't allow you to drive five million Palestinians out of the country. So you're stuck with them. So, so the only thing you can do is apartheid. You have to set up a system where we control all the land, we control the country, it's our country, uh, but we separate. Apartheid means separation in uh, Afrikaans. And in fact, the name of the wall, this huge wall that Israel has built in the West Bank, is called the separation barrier. We use the apartheid language. We simply say it in Hebrew, hafrada, instead of in Afrikaans. So you separate... And of course, you confine the indigenous population to small little islands, enclaves in the country. And that's what allows you to keep that population marginalized, even though they're large and so on, and you have control of the country. So apartheid is the necessary outcome of, of, of a set of colonial enterprise that can't either massacre or, or throw out or displace the local population. If you're stuck with them, then you're, you have to have an apartheid regime. Is your analysis leading you to the conclusion that there is already one state? The question is, will it be one apartheid state That's right. or one democratic state? Is that? That's right, exactly. I mean, Israel says it's one state, basically. You know, this is the land of Israel. And, you know, what we call the West Bank... You know, the idea of, of, of a two-state solution, detaching the West Bank for, for a Palestinian state, that for Israel is, uh, is ridiculous. I mean, this is Judea and Samaria. This is the heart of the land of Israel. Uh, so it's clear Israel never had any intent uh, to give it up. So, you know, Israel has set up an apartheid regime. Uh, they don't call it that. They don't call it anything. I mean, they call it, you know, nothing. It's, it's, it, you go to Israel... You have Israel. You have its uh, security and military uh, policies towards terrorism. What Israel would call it is security. The, the, the Palestinians have been reduced to a security problem, right? And so in a sense, uh, what Israel wants is an apartheid situation that, that it's already created, uh, you know, that, um, but without calling it apartheid. And where it gets its encouragement is that the international community has said fine. The United States has said fine. Yeah. Uh, the international community, is, there's no pushback against it. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting. When Amnesty put out its report a few months ago, really documenting why this is apartheid, and also documenting it's not only apartheid in the occupied territories, this is inside Israel as well. The whole thing is apartheid. Uh, and documented by all the violations of human rights and international, you know, legal instruments. Um, the American ambassador, some guy named Niles or something, rejected it angrily and said, that's not the language we use in the United States. What language don't we use? Human rights language. I mean, this is, uh, apartheid is, a, is a, it's not a curse. It's not an accusation. It's it's a it's it's a well defined concept uh, in international law. So the United States is saying, well, that's not language we use, which is true. I think he said a more revealing thing than he intended. Um, so that you know, Israel feels that it can get away with it. It can sustain apartheid in a way that South Africa couldn't, uh, because it has 
really the blessing of the international community and, and especially the United States. One last question for you. <clears throat> You've recently been on a speaking tour in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, speaking at the Greenbelt Festival. I think you've been there before and yeah, spoken yeah, yet. many times. Uh, you were also on a tour in Italy. Now you're embarking on another uh, U.S. speaking tour. Uh, you've been at this for many years, Jeff. Uh, how has your message remained the same? And how has your message evolved or changed over the years? Well, it's remained the same in that we, we like I said before, we were, we've always been a political organization. So we've always, I mean, house demolitions for us is a vehicle for, again, exposing what's happening, how does the occupation work, what Israel's intentions are, and so on. But, uh, but the idea is not only in house demolitions, is to resolve this whole, this whole issue. So that's been a constant all, all along. Uh, and I think what, what really is, I, I'm proud about uh, ICAD, is that, you know, we haven't got caught in a political position you know, for a long time, just because that's our opinion. If we now, I mean, we supported at the beginning the two-state solution. We can't forget that in 1988, at the, well, close to the beginning of Oslo, Arafat and the PLO accepted the two-state solution. Now, that was a mistake, a fatal mistake, really. But, you know, I can't be more Catholic than the Pope. <laughs> I can't say, I don't care what Arafat says, in other words, my, my, or not my, ICAD's position has to flow both from our analysis of what's happening, but also from, from what the Palestinians want. We have to be sensitive, again, to their, to their perspectives. So our analysis has changed over the years as the political situation has changed, starting from two states. The one-state solution we have today, the, the idea of one democratic state, isn't simply a political position. It, it, ar it arises out of our diagnosis of what the problem is, and, uh, and we've, we've helped formulate with Palestinians a 10-point program. So it really is, a, is an analysis and an attempt to address the real problems. It isn't just some political slogan or some position that we... That we so so our, our, you know, I, I met somebody recently uh, in the United States uh, after one of my talks who said to me, I've been listening to you now for 20 years, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> and he said, to your credit, you vary your presentations. I mean, it's true. For 20 years or more than 20, I've been coming, let's say, to the United States, speaking sometimes to the same audiences because it's the choir, you know, a lot of church audiences especially. Um, every year, if not more, well, I can't come back with the same talk every year or every time. I mean, not only do I have to vary it, but it varies by itself because as the situation changes, what I'm proud of is that ICAD is on top of it. We, I think we grasp, because we grasp the nature of the conflict, which is, again, a settler colonial kind of a thing, that allows us then to understand what's happening on the ground uh, you know, the analysis is ongoing, and how do we shift our positions? So every time I come back, we have a different take on what's happening. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that's, that's to our credit that, uh, that our uh, political analysis and the solution, in a sense, that we're suggesting, one democratic state, um, holds water. It makes sense. It really is powerful because it emerges from uh, a, a deep analysis of what's going on. It isn't just, uh, again, uh, because you know we're on the left and this and that, we decide this is the, this is the politically correct position. It, it really comes, and, and from that point of view, it, it changes as the situation changes. Jeff, it's good to spend this time with you. Uh, we're happy to host you back here in Fort Wayne. All right, thank you much, Mike.